Um, okay, the best way to measure these conditions is with balloon-borne radiosondes. Are often you, they're often used to measure the water vapor pressure and the atmospheric pressure and temperature as a function of height. And what you do is you just put instruments that measure these, hang them from a balloon, which also measures the height, and send them up. And they'll tell you what the conditions are, what the index of refraction is as a function of height. Uh, but that's at one geographic location, not, say, 50 miles or 80 miles away. Uh, when ducting occurs, significant amounts of the energy can, can be trapped, as I said. The, the, these conditions can be modeled very, very well by a leaky waveguide, and that gives very good results, and that has a low frequency cutoff for propagation. And so the frequency effects come into play with, uh, in, in dealing with areas where there are surface ducts. Climatic conditions. Uh, which have temperature inversions large portions of the time, can be areas where you have to worry about this a great deal. And two of note that I, 20 years ago when I was looking at some atlases of where there were temperature inversions a lot of the year, the southern coast of California near San Diego and the Persian Gulf have a good part of the year temperature inversions. And, but, but here in New, New England, the Northeast, they've been clearly measured also, and I've seen uh, very significant uh, ducting from one chart. And here is a not bad chart, but a condition around Massachusetts, the solid lines of the, the state boundaries in New England, and here's Cape Cod. And this is a radar located in the Boston area, and we can see that uh, there's a lot of, of ground clutter that we see out here. The mountains aren't that uh, high. And the range rings are at 50 kilometers. You, you really should only see ground clutter with the radar at Boston area, around this area. And these units, we'll look into them later when we study clutter on DBZ. Next, we're going to look at over-the-horizon diffraction. Uh, the first few graphs sets the stage by pointing out the different regions of propagation near this, the, the Earth. Here's the radar and, and the tan ray tangent to the Earth uh, in the early, before it hits the edge of the Earth. This region back here is called the line of sight region, and ray optics can be assumed. Uh, in the intermediate re region, just after the, the uh, hitting the edge of the Earth, interpolation techniques are used. But down here, on the other side of the Earth, below the horizon, is the diffraction region, and that's the uh, take interest in today. It's below the line of sight of the radar, and we have to directly solve Maxwell's equations, and the this, this signals are severely attenuated. But this does exist, and you can um, just imagine from your own, just the use of your voice in, in a room, where you can have a room which you're speaking in, and there can be a door on the side. And a person outside of that door um, can speak, and the waves will diffract around to you, even though you might be in a giant room and you're not getting... Uh, reflected sound waves. They'll, they'll reflect around somewhat to you, but severely attenuated. A good example of diffraction uh, can be found in looking at water, it's just a, an ideal way. And uh, this is an example of a tsunami uh, diffracted around a peninsula um, in the southern Pacific Ocean area. And here we see the tsunami wave coming up to this peninsula, and a little time later, uh, you can see the, the, the wave edging out and starting to diffract, and then later we see these diffracted waves that have bent around. Some of, it, some of the uh, waves have reflected back off, but some have, uh, have bent around and been diffracted. Uh, and, and that effect was uh, noticed in the and the recent tsunami in Indonesia. 
Uh, so the radar waves are the same in that they are diffracted around the curved Earth just as, as light is around a straight edge and ocean waves are bent by an obstacle. There's a great web reference that's uh, um, uh, on Wikipedia, uh, uh, but, but it uh, has copyright privileges, so I can't show it to you. But if you just click on this uh, URL, you'll see it quite readily. And it's a great, well, you'll see around a breakwater, I believe it is, uh, water waves coming in and just diffracting very nicely around the breakwater. The ability of radar to propagate beyond the horizon depends on two things, the frequency and the radar height. The lower the frequency, the better it is. And over the horizon detection, for that case, you really need significant power. It's necessary because the diffraction losses are very great. Now I'm going to move on to a, an example of a knife edge diffraction to show you uh, just in a, in a rough quantitative sense, for one specific example, the effect that frequency has to play. And this is adapted from a book by, on radar propagation by uh, Meeks, and it's uh, reference number six. It's in the list of references for this lecture. So here's what the example is. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to pr plot the propagation factor that's how diffraction affects things as a function of the target height. Now here we have the target at a, on a plane at 135 meters height. And the distance we're talking about is a total of 15 kilometers, five, uh, 10 kilometers to this obstacle, which is 100 meters high. The radar is 30 meters high. And we'd like to know how the, what's the energy dependence as we change the height of the target. And you can see that uh, this is the free space max range of the radar. And here, at 135 um, uh, meters height, is where all frequencies can see it. That height and above, there isn't a problem. But below that height, we have significantly higher propagation factor the lower the frequency is. So over the horizon propagation is enhanced at lower frequencies. Now when things are near the horizon this is a very useful tool to have to understand um, the detection range that a radar can have. And it uses the assumptions we made earlier about uh, the, the uh, range to the horizon uh, being the square root of twice that uh, four-thirds Earth constant times the radius of the Earth times the height of the radar and the, right, the height of the target. So if we have a target at height h sub t, we can apply the equation to it and it'll take you to just it on the horizon and also on the radar and that will give you an expression for uh, the grazing ray at the earth which was the maximum range of radar at height rh can detect a target at height h sub t. For targets below the horizon there's always target detection loss due to diffraction effects. And that, that loss can be from 10 to 30 dB. You can see that this, the, those losses in, in uh, the propagation factor H were quite uh, large, and that was for one-way propagation. At, and, and you notice it goes as F to the, the radar, it goes as F to the fourth power. So you need significantly increased um, signal-to-noise ratio in the radar to see below the horizon. And now let's look at the combination of effects where we look at the frequency dependence combined with the diffraction and multipath effects. The multipath effects result in good detection of low altitude targets at high frequencies. At high frequencies you have a lot of 
bands, we went over that earlier, and at low frequency, diffraction is favored. Now let's look at a target here that is uh, at an altitude of a hundred feet at a range of 60 kilometers and the radar altitude height is 100 feet. The loss at X-band, even though the multipath is better, the loss at X-band is 80 dB while the loss at L-band is 60 dB. So diffraction effects favor the lower frequencies and it's difficult at any frequencies is the takeaway. Those are big numbers to overcome. And now on to atmospheric attenuation. Uh, there are two um, resonances of microwave energy with components in the atmosphere that dominate attenuation. One is that of water, which is uh, marked in red, and the other is oxygen resonances, the tendency of O2 and H2O to um, absorb microwave energy. The attenuation is negligible at very long wavelengths and it's significant in the microwave band and it imposes very severe limits in millimeter wave band. At wavelengths at three centimeters or below, uh, the clear air attenuation is the major issue when you're designing a radar. And when you're in the millimeter wave uh, area, uh, there are windows that you can operate in where these conditions will be uh, dips in attenuation and very strong dips. So you could build millimeter wave radars at 35 gigahertz and 95 but at, with significant attenuation. But at 60 gigahertz, there's, you'll see in a minute, there's massive attenuation. When you put those together, and you look at the attenuation two-way through the entire atmosphere and notice we have here a uh, logarithmic scale and this is two-way attenuation in dB through the whole atmosphere as a function of radar frequency on the x-axis and we've that's a logarithmic scale and we have at different elevation angles of the radar uh, here's the uh, the water vapor, the water resonance, and here at 60 gigahertz is that huge attenuation due to oxygen. But you can see, uh, turns out there's a dip at 95 gigahertz and at 35 gigahertz where radars are built, and then and things things go to hell in a handbasket as you after expand, which is around the this region right here although they're significant at X-band. Now, th this is one graph which puts an awful lot on one picture, but for the radar designer you need um, a lot more than that. And th these graphs were taken from uh, Blake's uh, work that he's, he had done over a, a whole career in, in developing the, the sets of attenuation, uh, proper attenuation curves. And they've culminated in a book that he wrote, which is uh, the reference. And uh, you'll see those later. And you see I reference that book often. It's reference one for this lecture. And this is the most often way, uh, way that a radar engineer would use those curves to look up what the two-way attenuation, because of the radar, at, at S-band, 10 centimeter wavelength, um, no, these are the curves and we're plotting them as a range to the target. When they plateau off you can see uh, after you've reached a certain range you've gone through the entire atmosphere. But if you're only up at say uh, 75 nautical miles and you're at one degree you're not at all the amount of attenuation. You're only half the attenuation you'd be if you were near zero degree elevation angle. So this makes these curves very useful to um, get numbers to put into the radar equation and to use when you're as you're 
doing test to calibrate a radar, you want to say, well, what elevation was it? Now, notice that in the radar equation, we had the signal to noise is a function of 1 over r to the fourth power, and then there's all these loss factors. But notice that the range to the target, that the uh, loss due to the uh, atmosphere, is a function of the range. So one thing you have to do if you're going to be really exact in calculating your radar range equation is in an iterative manner calculate the radar range equation uh, using this, this curve and then seeing what the signal to noise is and then replug it in iterating several times to get the exact loss. And notice uh, this is the same curve just with the point that at zero to be degrees elevation angle and when you're outside of the atmosphere you get about 4.4 dB of elevation versus um, at five degrees where you go out of the uh, atmosphere quite quickly you only have one dB. So the lower the elevation angle the more of the atmosphere you're going to go through and that means the, the, uh, the higher the loss will be. Now let's compare, let's look at 10, uh, 10 gigahertz X-band. And you notice that it was around 4-ish dB at zero elevation angle, 4.4 at S-band. The attenuation goes up to 6.6 .6 dB at zero elevation angle um, at, at, at X-band. So you can see that there's a significant difference. So for targets with atmospheric uh, rate in the for targets in the atmosphere, the radar equations, as I said earlier, have to be calculated in an iterative approach so that you have the correct value of atmospheric loss. Now here at sea level is that atmospheric attenuation, and we see that water predominates and then oxygen. And usually, as I said earlier, the, uh, the use of high frequencies for long, low-range detection is... It, it, notice these units are in dB per kilometer. So you'd have 10 dB per kilometer would be the attenuation in going through this oxygen uh, resonance. Now, when we look at the microwave regions, there are other less important uh, issues, uh, such as heavy rain down to fog. And here we plot it as a function of radar frequency, and I put in the approximate radar bands that, that correspond to these frequencies. This is a logarithmic scale notice, and here a logarithmic scale, and this is the attenuation in dB per kilometer, you should know. And here we say uh, a good heavy rain, a downpour of 16 millimeters an hour, will give you a pretty hefty amount of attenuation. And then it could be 4 millimeters an hour, which would be moderate rain, and then drizzle, and then a fog. So the radar performance is at higher frequency is highly weather dependent. One graph which all of us use all the time is if you're at a certain, um, if a target is at a certain height and you're at a certain range, uh, what is the elevation angle? And this graph was developed again by Blake so that you can see what the range in nautical miles is uh, that you can see a target. So it's a it shows the relationship of radar range, height, and elevation angle for a normal atmosphere where the end, the refractivity, is 313.